My name is Samuel Ramsey. I'm a researcher with the United States Department of Agriculture. My name is Jay Evans. I'm a research scientist with the USDA uh, Bee Research Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. When I was seven years old, I was terrified of insects. I thought they were the creepiest creatures on the entire planet. And it became such an irrational fear and such a problem. I didn't want to go outside for recess. I didn't want to, to, to be around any insects. I would have nightmares about them at night. It was just a bit too much. So my parents took me to the library uh, and they told me people fear what they don't understand. And they grabbed a bunch of library books about insects. And that entire summer, I just sat around reading more and more and more about bugs. And by the end of that summer, uh, driving back from the, or riding in the seat, uh, the back seat back from the library, I told my mom, I wanna be an entomologist when I grow up. Cicadas are a really interesting type of insect, primarily because they have the longest life cycle of any described insect. Uh, they, they show up in these incredible numbers, such so dramatically that people have started referring to them as locusts and have referred to them as locusts for almost 300 years. But that's not accurate. They are not locusts. They're not even closely related to locusts. They're in a group of insects called the true bugs. And true bugs are all of the insects that have a straw for mouth parts and a specific conformation of their wings that makes them the true bugs. These guys um, use their straw mouth part to stick it into the root of a plant and suck the juices out of that plant, but they're feeding on liquids from these plants that are really, really, really um, diluted in the amount of nutrients that's available to the cicadas. So the cicadas aren't getting a huge amount of nutrition, and as a result, they grow really, really, really slowly. So cicadas, when we see them above ground, are these black insects, um, more than an inch long. They've got these big wings and giant red eyes. But when they're below ground, they're pretty nondescript. Um, they're white and squishy at one stage of their life cycle. They're a little bit harder and brown um, at another stage of their life cycle, but there's just not a lot of variation and intrigue in, when they're young. They really get their exciting look and what we think of as the cicada when they emerge from below ground. And oftentimes when they emerge from below ground, it's been 17 years since the last time they saw the sun. Uh, so cicadas are fascinating because um, in these particular ones, because yes, yeah, somehow, some way, they live in the dark underground from an, you know, a tiny little nymph and they start to grow up and they know in their clock inside them exactly when to emerge uh, 17 years later. So, you know, their, their mothers lay eggs on stems, those little nymphs drop into the ground and then um, just chew on roots for this long, long time. And they're not talking to each other. They're not like in communication, like a, like a, a bee colony would be, but they know uh, in their clocks, their developmental clocks um, in the dark there exactly when 17 years comes up. And that's what makes them really cool. And so when that happens, they crawl out uh, again as nymphs, not quite adults. They crawl out up the stems of the tree or plant nearby and then finish their development. And uh, they're only in the daylight for a month or so. And that's it. That's their, <laughs> that's their existence. The 13 and 17 year cicadas are part of a group of cicadas called the magic cicadas, uh, literally the magic cicadas, because the way that they emerge, the incredible numbers, sometimes 1.2 million cicadas per acre can emerge all in one area. And what makes them special is this ridiculous amount of coordination that goes into the process. They coordinate somehow such that all of them can emerge over the course of the same week or two, uh, where you get all of these cicadas flooding the ecosystem all at the same time. Now, the 17 year thing or the 13 year thing, these are different species of cicadas that emerge uh, during these, these years, but, but they're very closely related. And the reason for that 17 or 13 year system is one that, has fascinated scientists for years. We've tried to figure out one, how do they coordinate this and why do they pick such a strange interval? 13 and 17 are prime numbers. And so that means that they're divisible by themselves and one, that's it. 
And so you end up with this weird system where other creatures are emerging every year, maybe every couple of years. They can't really sync up to the life cycle of the cicada. What's thought to be the reason for that is there are annual cicadas that come out every year, um, but there are birds sitting there waiting for them. If it's a big cicada year, one year, maybe there'll be more birds the next year ready to pounce on the the babies from the last year. And so it's thought like over thousands, millions even of years, that that's a way that they decouple from the things that would be there waiting to eat them, right? Because there's no animal that's gonna wait 17 years to eat you. <laughs> so the so the cicadas on this track somehow, um, if they can make it work, which they have, at least some of them, they they come out at a time when no one's thinking they're gonna come out, which is really cool. The, the strategy with dealing with predators is really fascinating for the cicada because one, they don't have specialist predators. Pretty much every creature out there uh, has some organism that specializes in going after them, even if it's uh, a, a some sort of bacterium, even if it's some um, other insect or a type of bird or something. But because these creatures come out in this these strange intervals, it doesn't pay to sync up your life cycle to them because you'd have to find a way to only emerge every 17 or every 13 years. And that is really difficult to do. There are other, I guess you can call it a defense, but it's a weird system. Their other system to deal with predators is called predator satiation. And this is where things get weird. The idea is simply, there's going to be so many of us that you literally cannot eat all of us. And so the cicadas just all emerge at the same time with the knowledge that even if 5% of us get eaten, tons of us are still going to survive. They're, the creatures that eat us are eventually going to get full and they won't be able to eat any more of us and the rest of us can then mate and restart the life cycle. And they don't have great defenses. They can't bite or sting. These are basically like huge aphids with a harder shell, right? They, they suck plant sap and you know they, they don't, they're not really the toughest bugs in the world. So, so yeah, they're free food for lots and lots of birds and other maybe foxes and possums and other, other you know, rodents, that, squirrels perhaps, you know, things that can exploit that. Uh, dogs, the dogs will find them and start to eat them. And um, you know, that's not the best for the dog sometimes. But, um, but yeah, so they, they aren't really well defended when they come out, you know, for things that can get up into trees or find them. Their whole system is predicated on this idea that all of the cicadas need to be able to coordinate. Because think about what happens if um, a bunch of cicadas come out four years early, a bunch of cicadas come out three years early, two years early, one year early, and then some come out um, on the 17th year when they're supposed to emerge. Well. A bunch got decimated during the four years and it wasn't a large enough population for them to satiate the predators. So a bunch of them didn't get to mate and that population is dead. Same for the three years, the two years, the one year, and then the big 17 year, that one lost a whole bunch of its population because of the early emergences. It, it, it is remarkable that these cicadas have somehow figured out a way to have this system work so well in such a finely tuned method that they can all emerge at the same time. Um, there are a few stragglers. There are a few that will emerge um, sort of by accident as we understand it, um, maybe four years before, sometimes four years after, but that's about it. The rest of them all emerge at the same time and it allows for them to, uh, to, to really be able to make the most out of this crazy huge experience. It's fascinating because there are some that just do this year after year, right? They can, a cicada can eat enough in one year to come out. So it's not that they take 17 years of little nibbles to be big enough to come out as adults. There's, there's something about their delayed development that, that causes this, um, you know, to do it. And, and so that, it's, it's, a, it's a trick for biologists to figure out, I guess, but um, why that clock? We know other insects that may wait two years to develop. Um, you know, things that live in streams like stoneflies and such, some of them take two years, but 17 years and then your, your switch hits is crazy. I mean, it's, it's something really interesting. When these cicadas come out in these huge numbers, the one thing that they're interested in doing is mating. They will mate with each other, they will uh, pass on their genetic code, 
And the females will then move on to a plant, sometimes the same plant where they found their mate, and they'll cut these little slits into the sides of the branch and they'll lay a bunch of eggs in there. And a female cicada is able to lay a lot of eggs. As they're pumping these eggs into the branches, uh, it's just uh, days until those eggs will actually hatch. The small nymphs of the cicadas will actually fall from those branches to the ground. They will dig um, deep under, well, not super deep, um, a little bit more than a foot underground. And they will start their own um, little tunnel where they will feed on roots of some sort of large plant for just years and years and years and years and years. And then they'll all emerge to do this whole thing over again. So their life cycle, unlike a lot of other insects, doesn't involve uh, a pupa stage where they then transition into an adult. They start off as organisms that sort of look a little bit like the adult and grow and just get bigger and bigger and bigger until they eventually emerge and sprout wings. So I don't know of any other insect that has that long of a cycle. Um, you know, it could be wrong. There are other insects that live that long. Some of the ant queens live 20, 30 years, but they're, they're actively being fed by the others in the colony and they're, you know, doing their thing for those that whole time. They're up in the world, as it were, <laughs> um, inside protected in a nest, of course, but they're not like dormant and just chewing on a root. Uh, so I don't know of any other insect that's just in that, like stuck in that one life stage developing for that long. Cicadas are going to come out in incredible numbers. And I know a lot of people have referred to them as locusts and you can still sometimes hear this in news media. Like, so 1970 was one year and um, Bob Dylan actually wrote a song about it called Day of the Locust <laughs> in 1970. So like culturally we're all, everyone's just like, what is going on this year? But they do not have the kind of impact on plants that locusts have. People, when people see locusts, it is a concern because they're, they, they have been talked about like plagues uh, since the early writings of antiquity because when they show up, they leave pretty much no green thing behind in their wake. They chew up everything. The cicadas don't even have mouth parts necessary to chew things. They don't have jaws. They just have that straw that we talked about earlier. And so when they land on a plant, they'll stick that straw inside and they'll suck up a little bit of fluid from that plant. But usually the damage that they cause is pretty minimal for those plants, at least from their feeding behaviors. Now the females get very, very, um, let's say focused on laying eggs. And that excitable um, focus on making sure that they're laying as much eggs as possible can cause them to be a bit overzealous about getting as many eggs as possible into the same branch. And if they're laying eggs into a very small branch, uh, or if a bunch of them are all laying eggs at once into the same branch, that can cause the branch to die. And so sometimes you'll see whole trees where there's brown sections of the leaves um, near a bunch of totally healthy leaves. We call this flagging because the brown section looks like a flag swaying with the rest of the tree. That one branch will die, the rest of the tree will be fine. It's pretty subtle, right? It's not like, like tent caterpillars or something where the trees are totally um, stripped of their leaves. The only time where it's really a concern is in ornamental nurseries where people have planted a bunch of young trees. Uh, if the cicadas climb onto those young trees and kill a bunch of the branches, unfortunately that young tree can be uh, substantially damaged or stunted by that experience or even die. And so people will put nets over those smaller trees um, during the few weeks where the cicadas are out and at that point you can protect those trees, but any of the older, larger, healthier trees are gonna to be totally fine from this experience. They, When they emerge, it, it is a lot like a big spring break celebration, but it's more like spring break after 17 years of COVID-19 quarantine because they've been in isolation for so long and their version of Netflix is a tree root. So they are very interested in getting as much social interaction as they possibly can. So when they get above ground, they begin to do something called chorusing. And this is the other thing that they are really well known for, where they will climb up into a tree and they will make as much noise as possible to attempt to call over females to then find a mate in this system. And their noise in this, I guess I shouldn't call it a noise, but their call, 
it can be between 85 and 100 decibels incredibly loud that's like a dump truck going over a ton of potholes all next to your house uh, they get really 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 loud they are the loudest insect and it's not just because one cicada is there making that noise cicadas like to actually do all of this chorusing around a bunch of males because then that amplifies the sound and makes it even more likely that a female will hear it and come over in their direction so things get really 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 intense out there. And I'm really looking forward to hearing that again, because it is, it, some people refer to it as noise, but I think of it as a song. And it's a song that really extols the virtues of finding the right one. <laughs> Even though it sounds like a whistle, it's more of a, it's like a file, a rasping noise. So it's literally like a, it's a, they're playing a percussion instrument in some ways, instead of a, a whistle or a, or a chirp. They've got a set of membranes connected to some ribs on the side of their body. And that whole um, structure is called the timbrel. And the timbrel is attached to a muscle on each side of their body. The muscle pulls the timbrel and it deforms the ribs. As the ribs buckle, they make this vibration. And so when they buckle uh, in one direction, they make the vibration. And then when they go back to normal, they make a vibration. And so as the muscles are pulling on these, you get that click and then the release and another click. And the thing is it happens on both sides of their body and there are multiple ribs in each timbrel. So every time you buckle, you hear sort of this, this uh, very odd sound, um, this set of parallel vibrations. And then the back end of their body is hollow. And so it creates an amplifier for this system such that the noise is even louder and they can use their wings to even direct the sound. There are some broods that are more common. This is the mid-Atlantic brood, right? It goes from here up to New Jersey, Virginia to New Jersey kind of stretch. And there are others in the Midwest that are on a totally different cycle. And then there are the 13-year ones that are also kind of have peak years. So, so whatever happened, it may have been 100 years ago, well, well, or 17 times X years ago. We don't know. <laughs> it has to be on that time frame. But whatever happened, there was a boom year for this brood, like everything lined up. They were perfect and, you know, they just went crazy. And so that's why this particular one still is especially great every 17 years in this region. And we don't, I don't know that we know what happened, you know, back in the day that set off brood 10 as the, as this sort of crazy good year. And so the ones that, uh, will, that emerged in Boston, uh, maybe the same species, but a different brood that's going to emerge in a different year than the ones that emerged in um, Washington, D.C., or the ones that end up emerging over in uh, uh, Georgia or something. So it's, it's quite an experience to see these different broods emerge in different areas. Some states even have multiple broods that are all a part of their area. And so the southern part of the state will have one brood, the eastern part of the state will have another brood. It's quite fascinating. We have brood 10. Um, but there are, I believe, 14 broods that uh, all show up. They were originally listed as 16, but two of them either have gone extinct or were just mislabeled as another brood. Um, and they're distributed all over the Eastern United States. Um, sadly enough, this is not distributed all over the United States, uh, but just primarily the Eastern part. I, w I was actually in college in 1987, and um, I remember just this pounding noise at night in New Jersey where I was of um, the cicadas. And I'd never seen anything like that. Like it was just, it was crazy. And you'd see them all over trees. And it did feel like it was a plague of, they're not locusts, but it felt like some sort of plague. Um, but in the end, it's just really cool because they don't do that much harm compared to some other insects. And then, and then they're quiet, you know, the next year and you miss them after the, <laughs> after that year. Um, and then the, the 2004 one, actually my, my daughter who was born in 2000, um, you know, she, she was out there just like picking them off trees and looking at them. And that was the first insect probably experience of her life of like, what's the world coming to, you know, as a four-year-old when <laughs> this tree that used to be just a tree is now crawling with these, these uh, insects the size of small mice. I was in high school, but it was my first year of high school. And I was in the middle of a standardized test 
when uh, I believe there was some sort of fire drill or some reason why they needed us all to leave the building in mass. And so there are all these students who are taking an exam who are all moved on to the front lawn of the school. And this is when the cicadas first emerge. This is close to uh, early May and there were just tons of them. And no one else my age had actually seen them before. And so this was a new experience for everybody. And the cicadas were just landing on people because they don't have great eyesight. You don't look that different from a tree to them. Uh, they were making all kinds of noise. Students were freaking out. There were a, a few people who were running into the street to try to get away from the cicada. And I remember yelling to them, the cars are a much bigger problem than the cicadas. <laughs> like the cicadas can't hurt you. The car definitely can. But what I, something that became very clear to me in that experience was that uh, people are not going to measure the threat in this situation. They're going to see this big insect they're immediately going to think that it has some way to bite them or sting them. It's going to animate these fears and people are going to usually run from them. They could, maybe they make your sidewalk slippery or something. If you step on them, that could be a slip and fall accident, but um, there's really nothing. They're, they're, um, they're noisy, you know, and some people get stressed out by them. I don't want to belittle that. Like if people are anxious, you know, they, 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 they that's a valid uh, concern. Um, but they won't, they won't sting you. They won't bite you. They won't, um, they'll keep you awake at night. Maybe if you like to sleep with the windows open. Uh, but yeah, other than that, they're not, they're not, they don't carry disease. Like they won't, you know, carry a disease to people or pets. So the more people increasing awareness about this can help people not be quite as surprised when the cicadas do show up. Because a big part of it is just, I've never seen a, a close to two inch long insect with bright red eyes just land on me and start walking around and making these loud shouting noises at me. Like it's, it's an assault on the senses. And when you have actually, when you're not surprised by that experience, it's a lot easier to integrate that into, oh wow, this is nature happening all around me. I think it's just one of these things that reminds us, you know, that that even if we live in the city, there's kind of a there's a bit of nature still there, right? Even uh, city trees will get covered by these. So, you know, though, I'm sure a lot. Sadly, that makes me think that there are probably a lot of 17 year old cicadas right now who have been paved over. So they're gonna. It's sort of sad. They're gonna come up, dig, 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 and then be like, ah, uh, that's it. So. So we've developed the world a lot in the last 17 years, unfortunately, um, but many of them will make it through. And, and they really, yeah, they're just kind of a, a reminder that there is a natural world out there in some ways. So one thing that I'm hoping that I can do this year is encourage people to look more closely at these organisms. Uh, we have a lot of people who are coming out of isolation situations, quarantine situations that have spent a lot of time out in nature this year. Um, hiking has been top priority for a lot of people during the pandemic because it's one of few places, being out in nature is one of few places where you don't have to worry um, quite as much about being infected with COVID-19 or something. And so uh, I'm hoping that that excitement about nature is going to carry over such that when people see these cicadas, instead of running from them and potentially running out into the street to try to get away from an insect that can do nothing of any concern to you, uh, I'm hoping that people will be willing to pick them up, look at them, listen to them, and enjoy what it is that they're bringing here because they are literally the magic cicadas. <laughs>